Here is a postcard sent by John Edgar to his father from a prison of war camp in Germany, Christmas 1941. His parents lived in Dow Street. The card simply says, Christmas greetings, from John, plus the words that were included on the card. The address page shows that the card came from Stalag 8B in Germany. We can see that apart from where John has written the address, the printed words are all in German. War had been spoken of in Port Melbourne as early as the 1850s. With the Crimean War going on in Europe, there developed a fear of the Russians. Victorians became extremely nervous of a Russian invasion. As a result, forts were set up all over the Australian coastline. These forts were also called batteries. A battery was established in Sandridge in the 1850s. Rifles were stored there, and the Victorian Volunteer Artillery Regiment practiced there. The Sandridge Battery was sometimes called the Lagoon Battery, as it was on the beachfront near the lagoon. The first actual war that Port Melbourne men were involved in was the Boer War of 1899-1901. to It was a rebellion of Boers, farmers in the Transvaal, South Africa, against the British, the Victorian government decided to send soldiers to help the British. When the first contingent left, the town hall was decorated with bunting, soldiers and horses were loaded onto the ships at Railway Pier. There was even a Christmas card received from a soldier in the Boer War. When the Port Boys returned home, an arch was placed in Bay Street. It said, Welcome home, brave boys. Some port boys also went off to China in 1900. A nationalist movement had grown up in China which opposed foreign interests. 35 men from Port Melbourne went off to assist Britain to fight in what was known as the Boxer Rebellion. This group of American warships arrived in Port Melbourne in August 1908. They were not involved in war, but they were battleships ready to defend the United States of America. Their arrival in Port Melbourne was greeted with a lot of enthusiasm. Thousands of people crowded around the port foreshore to welcome them. Here is a postcard made at the time. When the Great White Fleet left Port Melbourne, a big crowd came to see them off. The First World War began in August 1914. Port Melbourne quickly became involved. By September, there were 50 Port Boys in the Broadmeadows camp. They were given cardigan jackets made by women and girls of Swallow and Ariel. Employees at Swallow and Ariel, in their own time, set up a group called Busy Bees. Garments were knitted and supplies sent to the men at the front. As the words say on the cart, we will help them until the war is won. Swallow and Ariel sent tins of fruit to our soldiers. Soldiers got off the train at Port Melbourne. Waiting to board ship, many waited on the piers to embark. The Port Melbourne Standard published letters from two port men describing the landing on Gallipoli. Private Edmund Frame of Rouse Street wrote to his parents from hospital. The Standard was soon recording the deaths of port men. Harry Harris of Clark Street wrote to his brother. As the war went on, there were more reports of deaths, and by the end of the war, more than 200 men from port had been killed. On the 11th of November 1918, when it was announced that the war had finished, there was rejoicing all over port. In December, there was a civic welcome to returned sailors and soldiers who lived in Port Melbourne. One local man, George Williams, won the military medal. There were many welcomes home, and the Port Melbourne Council gave a greeting certificate to all the returning men. A war memorial was erected in Beach Street, and each year the Anzac ceremony is held here. Port Melbourne was just recovering from a very serious depression when, in September 1939, 
Australia was again at war. Because of Port Melbourne's position, people knew that it would have a significant effect on their lives. The Port Council wasted no time in going into action. On the 4th of September, they declared that a Red Cross company be formed. Port men were quick to join up, and the local paper reported that the residents of Port Melbourne were doing their bit. Bill Lane said, the young blokes from the borough, like their fathers and uncles, were into the services. I joined the Navy and was sent to England. No matter where you went, port blokes were there. It was a common sight to see troops marching down to Port Melbourne Station and to Prince's Pier to the ships that were to take them overseas. Some port men were captured by the enemy and became prisoners of war. That did not stop them sending Christmas cards. As we saw on our postcards, these ones were sent to Mr and Mrs Edgar in Dow Street. Once Japan entered the war, big changes occurred in port. One notable thing was that the Port Melbourne Recreation Reserve was taken over by the military. In early 1942, it became a camp for the American Army. American soldiers were often seen in Bay Street. The Record newspaper reported on February 28, 1942, North Port Oval taken over, acquired for military purposes. Two months later, there was a headline. Port Melbourne in the war news, Tokyo Radio claims heavy bombing. In fact, no bombing had occurred. The Prime Minister, John Curtin, said this was a further demonstration of the completely irresponsible and fantastic lies on which the enemy propaganda is based. Port Melbourne had not been bombed, but because of the port facilities and key industries located here, it was seen to be particularly vulnerable to aerial attack. Searchlights were being used each night around the industrial complexes, but it was decided by ordinary people that some changes were needed. Sandbags were piled in the streets against shop windows to prevent them from being shattered. Air raid shelters were dug in schoolyards and in some of the parks and in many back gardens of private homes. An air raid siren was also placed on top of the police station. School children were trained in drill in case of a bombing raid. Graham Street schoolboys even assisted in making camouflage nets. Boys of a Port Melbourne public school give up most of their spare time to important war work. They are making camouflage nets, of which our armies have tremendous need. Each net contains 5,000 knots. During one weekend, a single boy made a complete net, roughly 15 feet square. The hairdo of a really great artist. The Defence Department supplies materials, the lads, the elbow grease. They hope to see Hitler slip on it. It's civilian war work that really counts. Under test, the net proves its durability. It was not designed for this kind of work, but if necessary, it can take it. The council had obtained permission to construct air raid shelters on public land, but in 1942 it thought it should do more. It had given over the Excelsior Hall to the Air Raid Precautions Group. Rationing was introduced in Australia in 1942. Port people, like the rest of the Australian community, had to carry identity cards and have ration books. Firstly, it was clothing. If you were buying clothes, you had to hand the retailer the coupon book and the required number of coupons were cut out. Food rationing began with tea and later with sugar and butter. Meat rationing commenced in 1944. Most people accepted clothes rationing readily enough. When it came to a wedding day, it could be quite difficult for a bride to get something suitable. Vera White, who recently turned 90, remembers her wedding day in 1944. Her family lived in Beacon Road, Port Melbourne at the time. Her marriage to George took place at Holy Trinity Church in Bay Street in October 1944. George was on leave from the Navy. 
My sister Violet had got married six months before me and her wedding dress was made of mosquito knitting. I was able to wear the dress which saved not only money but also clothing coupons. Finally, in September 1945, the war came to an end. Troops began to return on ships at Port Melbourne. A group of prisoners of war were met by a number of cars provided by the RACV. Wars have formed a significant part of Port Melbourne's history. This has been particularly so because of our position as a port. Station Pier and Princess Pier saw so many troops leaving and returning.